Hi everyone, this is Casey Jones. Well, I've done a number of videos about the Millennium Tower Saga in San Francisco. I recently put out a community poll asking which follow-up video you would like to see from me, and Millennium Tower was the overwhelmingly popular choice, so that's my next video here that you're seeing. This update is based on email correspondence that I had with the Department of Building Inspection in the city of San Francisco. I posed a series of technical questions related to things that I've been talking about in these videos, and about three to four weeks, I actually got an answer from them. So I'll go over what they say, uh, talk about what I think the implications are for their response, and uh, we'll jump right into it. Now, I'm just going to briefly give a recap of what's been going on with this project. I don't want to rehash everything. If you want to learn more of what I've talked about previously, check out the playlist. I'll post a card here in the video. You could click on that and, and run through those. If you haven't seen those already, then perhaps come back to this video. It would be uh, in better context if you didn't have that per previous familiarity. So again, quick recap. The Millennium Tower is a 58-story, 645-foot-tall residential building, high-end luxury building, that is, and it's located at 301 Mission Street in San Francisco. The building has a total of 419 residential units. The building was constructed between 2005 and 2009, and it was placed on relatively shallow foundations that did not extend all the way to bedrock. And for a structure of this size, a full depth uh, foundation system of piling extending to bedrock was certainly in order. So pretty quickly, the total amount of settlement exceeded that that was calculated by the design engineer over the lifetime of the building, actually in just a few short years. They recorded as much as 19 inches of foundation settlement, and it didn't occur evenly either. So there's quite a bit of differential settlement across the building, which has produced a total of 29 inches of building tilt at the upper floor at the northwest corner of the building. The original foundation consists of over 960 concrete pile with a depth of about 80 feet below ground surface. A few years ago, a design was implemented to try and stabilize the foundation for this building. And keep in mind, this mat that connects the piles is 10 feet thick reinforced concrete mat. So the design engineer for the repair effort, an engineer named Ron Hamburger, with the firm Simpson, Gumperts, and Hager, came up with this design involving perimeter piling. And they were gonna install 53 pile, they ended up only installing 18 at the northwest corner of the building. Now these remediation pile did extend to bedrock. A key aspect of this repair was the construction of a vault structure. This vault exposes the piling adjacent to the perimeter of that 10 foot thick mat foundation. And this piling, this 18 additional piling, was connected to the mat foundation on the perimeter. Now here's a detail that shows these anchor rod assemblies that go over the top of the pile and they inserted a hydraulic jack between the top of this frame and the top of the pile. And last summer they completed their jacking loads on this pile and they got just a very small amount of tilt recovery on the order of three quarters of an inch when they were expecting at least four inches near term. So as part of this remediation effort, the city of San Francisco required an extensive monitoring program, which I talk about in great detail in my most recent video on this project. They started out requiring the issuance of weekly reports and they've now turned into bi-weekly reports by this geotechnical company, Slate. There's a whole list of reportable conditions related to this monitoring program, things they wanna look out for in terms of maximum amount of decrease in the piezometric surface or the water level surface in the soil below this building, uh, total amounts of settlement, amounts of differential settlement, building tilt, and so on. And one of the key things that they're monitoring is not only the load on the individual piling, but the total load among all the piling. Now, as I've talked about in previous videos, there are two highly experienced engineers. One's a geotechnical engineer, Lawrence Karp, and the other's a structural engineer, Josh Harden, who wrote a letter to the San Francisco Board of Supervisors cautioning them about implementing their plan repair effort. And they favored an interior support system that included micropiling going through that existing foundation between the existing piles and extending to bedrock. And instead, everyone involved elected to implement this perimeter or this exterior support system. And uh, Hardin and 
and Carp and Harden had serious technical concerns about this and in fact predicted accurately as it turned out that their repair efforts would actually increase the amount and rate of building settlement and tilt, which is exactly what happened. And for that reason, that's why they modified their program going from 53 pile to 18, because the act of installing these casings and extracting soil was essentially undermining the building foundation, causing more settlement. So this first letter that they wrote, cautioning about the plan repair measures was in 2019. And then in April, 2022, they wrote a more pointed letter pointing out that they had serious concerns about the structural integrity of this mat foundation. And in particular, they suspected that there was serious distress and yielding between the pile tops and this mat foundation such that it was possible that there was even no connection in some places due to damage. And they also pointed out that such concerns, if they existed, would pose a serious detriment to performance of the building, particularly during an earthquake. So, as I said, these issues prompted my questions to the city of San Francisco. I didn't want to hit them with too many questions because I figured they wouldn't respond if I did. I was, quite frankly, not expecting a response at all, so I was quite pleased, and they were very professional with their response. But uh, I'll let you decide how meaningful and realistic their response is relative to the concerns that have been brought up by people in the know, other engineers who routinely work in this area of San Francisco, both re with regard to geotechnical engineering and structural engineering. So my first email was to the Department of Building Inspection, and a week later they said they wouldn't be able to respond to my questions, and they suggested instead I talk to their communications director, Patrick Cannon. So the first question I posed, there was a total of three, and I'll just read it here. Based on the monitoring report data through the most recent report issued, Report 124 dated November 1, 2023, I noticed that the total applied load to the piles is steadily decreasing and will likely reach a reportable condition by this spring. Do you know the cause of this apparent relaxation of loading on the pile? Now, as I mentioned in a previous video, this relaxation could be due to creep of the pile. It could be that it's uh, just compressing ax axially, or it could be that the pile didn't penetrate into hard enough bedrock so that there's additional penetration occurring into bedrock over time. And I'm a geotechnical engineer, not a structural engineer. There's been uh, structural engineers in U on YouTube that pointed out that they think the connection, the, the steel strap as it were, at the base of these anchor rods that are part of that assembly connecting the, the jack to the top of the piling is in fact yielding because they don't think that that metal bar is thick enough and strong enough to withstand the constant high loads that these piles are subjected to. So I'm just going to go through each question and then I'm going to circle back with the answers that they gave. <clears throat> My second question was, why are these monitoring reports simply data reports with no analysis or discussion about trends or pending action items relative to the readings? And my third question, has anyone with a city or design engineer of record for the retrofit inspected the condition of the pile mat connection in key locations as recommended by engineers Carp and Carden in their 2022 letter to the San Francisco Board of Supervisors? They stated that they anticipate there could be plastic yielding at this connection due to strains in the mat foundation associated with differential settlement. They stated that the ability of the MT building to perform adequately during a large earthquake is in question until the condition of this connection is verified. Connection or connections among multiple pile. So this is a long answer to the first question, so just bear with me because I want to read it verbatim. So this is my question about pile loading, the total pile loading reaching the reportable condition of 16,200 kips, which as I pointed out in previous videos, this loading is steadily decreasing and you could project the, the best fit or the slope of this line to where it intersects the 16,200 foot kip uh, amount. And you see that it's gonna hit that amount probably next spring the way on current trends right now, May, May, possibly early June. So, so here's their response. According to the project sponsor, calculations conducted by Mr. Egan, the geotechnical engineer of record, and his team at Slate Geotechnical in support of the building permit submittal for the project included a series of soil foundation interaction analysis conducted using 
FLAC 3D software. These analyses were subjected to rigorous external peer review by the expert panel working on behalf of the Department of Building Inspection and also Dan Brown and Associates, an expert in deep foundation design and construction, separately retained by building ownership. The FLAC analysis clearly predicted that the pile loading would decrease with time and based on this, the design incorporates provisions to re-energize the jacks should it, be, should it be deemed appropriate to do so. Factors that affect this decreasing load in the piles include rebound of the foundation, that is reversal of past tilt and settlement under the reduced loading on the original foundation, creep in the concrete mat extension that transfers load from the original foundation to the new pile, creep in the soils beneath the building and in the new piles and their interaction with the surrounding soils. The FLAC analysis suggests that these behaviors will decrease slowly with time and ultimately stabilize at a constant value of pile load. If the pile loading falls below the 16,200 kip reportable condition, as shown on figure 13B of the monitoring reports, this would trigger an evaluation to determine if remedial action is necessary. The evaluation would include a review of the building settlement and tilt behavior at that time, as well as the rate of change in the pile loads. With settlement along the north and west sides arrested and tilt recovery now slowly occurring, there likely would not be a need to do anything. However, if a decision were made to add jacking loads, the jacks can be easily accessed through the manholes and vaults provided for that purpose and energized using a portable hydraulic power unit without any disruption of occupancy or pedestrian traffic. So they're, they're happy with what's going on. Now I will mention that Dan Brown and Associates, I mentioned them in a previous video, they were actually on site when the installation of these 18 remediation piles was occurring and they raised alarms about uh, the amount of soil that was being removed and that they were observing increased rates and amounts of building settlement. And promptly thereafter, Dan Brown was told that they were no longer allowed to make their own observations directly at the job site. They had to rely on information that was provided to them to write their reports, uh, their review reports. And again, in a previous video, I, I said, I don't know the ins and outs of why that decision was made, that that's their business. I just know from my own experience, if I have independent testing or observation to do, I don't rely on third party information if there's something that I can observe directly. So that, take that for what it's worth. The other thing I'll point out is they, they basically base their analysis on a finite element program. And again, I've mentioned previously that there's a lot of assumptions that go into these computer models. And you really can't know everything about the condition of the soils, the condition of the mat, where cracks may occur in the, in the foundation, everything about the pile head and mat connection throughout the entire foundation. I mean, again, there's 960 pile under this foundation. So my second question was, why are these merely data reports? I think it'd be far more meaningful if there was narrative and analysis saying, hey, this is the type of load reduction that we expected on the pilings, or this is more than we thought, or less than we thought, or hey, we're gonna have to probably apply new loading to these piles around this time frame. There's none of that there, which is very interesting to me. I'd be curious what you all make of that, but here's our response to that question. The format of the reports was jointly developed by the design team, the city's external review panel, and the Department of Building Inspection. The monitoring plan includes a series of reportable conditions indicated on page four of each report that would trigger analysis and evaluation and submittal of a report containing recommendations for needed actions. This was the format agreed to by all parties and established very deliberately with appropriate flags should an issue arise. Now that external review panel and the Department of Building Inspection, uh, CARP and Carden were highly critical of the makeup of that review team in terms of their technical uh, and engineering competence. Okay, so my third question related to whether anybody actually exposed some of the pile head mat connections to verify whether there was separation or, or damage or breakage at, at these connections as recommended by CARP and Carden in their April 2022 letter. So initially I misreferenced the, that letter, that second letter as being in 2021. So 
I'm going to circle back to this, but I just want you to have that information as you hear this response. The July 10th, 2019 letter from Carp and Carden to the Board of Supervisors, we don't have a 2021 letter from them, alludes to damage to the top of the existing piles induced by rotation of the existing building mat under the influence of sediment, tilting, and dishing. The city's panel of outside experts, engineering design review team, the ERD, the EDRT, specifically asked the design team to address each of the concerns expressed in the CARP and CARDEN letter as their comment log item number 188. With regard to alleged damage to the pile tops, the design team provided the EDRT with analysis conducting use, using CSI perform software, CSI safe software, as well as analysis of the piles conducted using extract software, E-T-R-A-C-T. As noted in the design team's response to the EDRT comment 188, these analyses used then measured settlement, tilting, and dishing data, as well as a series of scenarios that projected additional map movement, far beyond that which has occurred at this time. None of these analyses suggested damage to the pile tops or an inability to resist the effects of severe earthquake shaking. Further to this, as part of the construction completed several months ago, the pile top to mat connections of the outer row of piles along Mission Street and Fremont Street were exposed to enable interconnection of the new mat extension with the existing mat. Engineer, engineers from the EOR's office inspected the condition of these piles and their connection to the mat in these areas and did not observe any damage. So a couple things that I want to point out here. Where the uh, pile were installed, these perimeter piling, that's where the settlement amount was greatest. And Carp and Carden expressed concerns about piling in other locations where the mat would be brought into tension and could separate from the top of the piles, which that condition wouldn't be expected at the perimeter where is apparently the only place they actually inspected this connection to the pile head and mat. And in the Carp and Carden second letter, they strongly recommended that the areas of concern relative to this issue uh, have the pile top mat connection exposed and, and physically observed to verify the integrity of that connection. So after I got that initial response, I emailed them and pointed out that, hey, I had the date wrong. It was April 2022 for that second CARP and Carden letter. And I forwarded them a copy of that letter uh, as issued by the CARP and Carden. And a few days later, I got this response from Mr. Hannon. We reviewed the letter you sent and stand by our previous response. Thank you, Patrick. So again, they did get back with me. So I'm just going to run through a few slides of this monitoring data associated with the loading on the pile. Here's a plot of the individual loading on the piles, and you can see the downward trend. This next plot is of the total pile load. You can see the line sloping downward to the right towards that dash red line, which is the intersection with the 16,200 kip total loading, that's a reportable condition. And so this is in the report 124 from November, the projection of this slope indicates somewhere around a little before June that that reportable condition would be achieved. Now there's been, since uh, report 125 issued, again, shows the same continued downward trend if I project the slope downward, it shows an intersection with the reportable condition in about that early June time frame. So again, I'm very pleased that the city responded. Uh, I recently did a video about a retaining wall collapse in Coquitlam in uh, Vancouver area of Canada, and they didn't even acknowledge my email questions to them. So again, I give San Francisco credit for at least responding. I suspect that my questions did go to the design team given the amount of time that elapsed for my question and the answers. But uh, in general, and make your own characterizations of this, but my take on this is that the design team is quite comfortable with their narrative in terms of their computer modeling and the monitoring results that they've achieved so far. Again, I think there's quite a bit of cover technically and politically when these monitoring reports don't include any narrative or analysis. And I think the concerns remain about the condition of the pile head mat connection in critical parts of this building. So let me know what you think. Also, just FYI, we've opened up channel memberships here, just a, a very basic level. 
And so I thought that might be one way um, some of you would choose to support the channel. I appreciate all the comments and the interaction. The engagement's been great. I've had people send me additional information, photos, uh, stories about various projects. Essentially, they're crowdsourcing a lot of information that I can incorporate into future videos. So that's very much a contribution to the channel. Also, check out the link in the description to download your free copy of my largest civil engineering disasters from the past 100 years. Thanks very much, everyone, and please stay tuned for future videos.